probably, Lord willing, make it through the first 15 verses here. We typically revisit these main events that occurred around the time of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection every, every year around this time as Easter approaches. It's good for us to revisit passages that, that maybe we have read many times or maybe tonight's your first time to ever really pay attention to or read or hear this passage, but this is on my short list of passages that every time I read it, it's just good. It is just such a good passage and such a good example and one that is easy for us to understand. You know, some of the passages we look at are difficult. We talk about interpretations and maybe what this word means or that word, but but I always love it when you come to a passage that, that really is not difficult. It is simple and easy for us to understand, and hopefully we live by uh, the things that we see in Jesus' example here. So John chapter 13, we are um, not going, obviously, in chronological order. The triumphal entry of Jesus coming into Jerusalem occurred before this. However, since Sunday is Palm Sunday, we will talk about that then. So we're skipping ahead a little bit, and then we'll, we'll backtrack Sunday, and then we'll, we'll catch back up next Wednesday uh, as we kind of go through some of these key uh, events that took place at the time of Jesus' well, crucifixion. Well, Wednesday is Passover. Yeah, yeah. So we will, we'll be talking about these things as we, uh, as we prepare. So let's pray, and we will get into it. Father God, we come to you and we thank you for um, these good words. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us tonight as we look at your word. I pray that you would help us to see the example of Jesus and to follow that example. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would speak in and through me and to each one of us. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. John... Chapter 13, verse 1. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, Jesus knew full well what was about to take place. Jesus had come for this particular purpose. He knew that it would soon come that he was going to give his life willingly on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, both those who had passed, those who had come before him, those who lived with him, and us, those who would come after him. And Jesus knew that his time had come, but he had successfully fulfilled his mission. He had done all that God had called him to do up to this point. He had loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. Okay, so from the time he came into this world to the time he started his ministry to now as his last days are approaching, his last hours are approaching, Jesus had completed his task. And his task was to love those that God had given him to love. And part of that task was going to be giving his life on a cross for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus, as John tells us here, completes his task to the end. Now, verse 2. Now, by the time of supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Issachariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. Now, we see this passage here, and perhaps if we are familiar with the story and Judas Iscariot, we know that Judas is going to betray him. And we see here in the passage that the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas. And perhaps we say, well, how could Judas be deceived? Was there some special deception or something great? Shouldn't he have noticed that the devil was tempting him to betray Jesus? And shouldn't he have known better? Well, I would venture to say that probably Judas' temptations are no different than yours and mine. In the same way that Judas was tempted to do what is wrong, uh, so we are tempted to do what is wrong. And perhaps we don't realize the greatness of the sin of our temptations that we give in to. And what was Judas's motivation? As we read the story, we see 
that his motivation was nothing more than greed. That was the temptation for him. Hey, you know, if I turn Jesus in, there's these people that want to kill him, and I can, I can take these people to where he's going to be, and I'll get my 30 pieces of silver, and obviously that greed, that temptation was enough for Judas. We already know that Judas didn't, didn't really care uh, about the poor and all these things that perhaps he mentioned as he was the treasurer of the money. The scripture says that really he was just greedy. He just cared about the money. And, and so we see that problem in Judas in the scripture. And it's that temptation, it's that greed that's probably no different than any greed that you and I may be tempted by or any other sin that may grab a hold of us that tempts us to do what we should not do. In this case, it was Judas's greed that was his temptation, and it was that temptation that had brought the time to pass, that it was going to be this way, that Jesus was going to be betrayed. And you may say to yourself, why did Jesus even pick Judas? Well, perhaps this is the way that it was going to be fulfilled, the only way that it was going to be fulfilled so that everything in Scripture could be fulfilled in the way that it was prophesied. And so the end had come, the time had come, and Jesus knew that the end was come, and he had remained faithful to that end. And Judas had given in to, he had decided to give in to that temptation to betray Jesus for a little bit of money. And it says in verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands that he had come from God and he was going back to God. So Jesus knew this is what I was called to do. God has given me everything and this is, this is the, the privilege, perhaps might be a way to describe it, that Jesus says, I will take this burden. This is my privilege. This is my choice. This is my love for humanity that I will accept being betrayed by one whom is close to me that I will endure the pain and suffering for all the sins that you and I and everyone else would ever commit. And Jesus knew his task, his calling, his what was about to happen to him, and Jesus says, I am ready to do this. Verse 4, So he got up from supper, laid aside his robe, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet and dry them with the towel tied around him. Now, this is quite a beautiful scene for us to imagine. Here is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And of the lowliest of tasks that there were to clean people's feet, it's not a task that was, that was a very good job. Now, even... Today, tonight, if I were to tell you you needed to wash people's feet, you probably would not be jumping up and down to do so, and our feet are relatively clean compared to what they may have been in those days. We wear socks and shoes, and our feet are still nasty and dirty, but in those days, you're walking in sandals, you're walking on dirt roads, you're walking where, where animals go and use the bathroom here and there, and your feet are just absolutely filthy. And so this would not have been a job for someone who was higher up. This would have been a job for the lowliest of the low. But yet, here is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is higher than any, and yet he is taking the job of the lowest. And Jesus Christ begins to wash the feet of his disciples. And what a beautiful scene this is for us to consider. Verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you don't understand now, but afterward you will know. You will never wash my feet, ever, Peter said. Jesus replied, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Now, obviously, Peter is pretty bold. We see that on occasion in Scripture. He speaks up. And here he speaks up again. You're not going to wash my feet. Now, maybe Peter realized, hey, wait a minute. You, you, you're the son of God. You're the, you're the Messiah. You're the Savior. You, you don't need to be washing my feet, and I'm not going to let you do it. But what did Jesus tell him? If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. 
And so Jesus realized there needed to be some washing, some cleansing that needed to take place. Uh, we talked about that uh, some Sunday when we talked about baptism, the symbolism there of, of being washed, of being clean. Uh, but the, the, the cleaning, the washing, the purification that takes place for our soul is by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what washes our sins away. But, but we must be washed. We must be made clean. And so with the act that Jesus did and our faith in his act of crucifixion and resurrection and, and, and the symbolism of baptism, that, that shows that we have put our faith in Jesus, that our sins have been washed away, that we have been made clean. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And we must be washed by Jesus Christ to have a part with him. So Simon Peter responded in verse 9. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet. But he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, you are not all clean. So Simon Peter, he, he says, okay, well, if, 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 if being washed is good, then don't stop on my feet. Wash everything. And Jesus says something here that, that is really hard to know exactly uh, what he meant. At least there's some disagreement as to, as to what Jesus meant here. But he says, um, the one who is bathed doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. Now, perhaps what Jesus is saying here is that the apostles are all clean, except for the one which he acknowledges Judas. That is, they are his. They already have faith in him. They have already been cleansed by him. But maybe what he is saying here is that even those who put their faith in him, while we don't need to be cleaned all over again, there are occasions in our life that sin creeps up. That is, as we walk, our feet get dirty. Now, you can go home and take a shower tonight, and you can be clean all over. But what's the first thing that's probably going to get dirty? It's going to be your feet, because you've got to walk. And unless your floor is just spotless, it won't take long for your feet to get dirty. And, and you may not even want to go to bed with dirty feet. You, you may walk around, your feet get dirty. You may want to wash your feet before you get in the bed. Now, the rest of you doesn't have to be washed because you're already clean but you may have to wash your feet more often because they are more apt to get dirty. And perhaps, perhaps there's an illustration there, some symbolism there that Jesus is saying, no, for those who are clean, for those who are mine, you, you are clean, but, but there are occasions in which you will need to be cleaned again or in which you will need to repent, which you will need to ask forgiveness of sins. But there is one here that Jesus acknowledges is not clean. That is, does not have faith in Jesus Christ, and that is Judas. Now, that's one interpretation as to maybe what Jesus meant when he used that language. That might be something, if it interests you, that you want to study further. Verse 12, when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his robe, he reclined again and said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. This is well said, for I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. So what's the purpose of Jesus doing this? I mean, th there possibly was a servant around that could have washed their feet. They could have washed their own feet, but yet Jesus to chose to wash their feet. He chose to do this lowly lowliest of task and to humble himself before his disciples and wash their feet and for what reason did Jesus do this he says if i am your lord and teacher and i am washing your feet you need to wash one another's feet this is the example jesus said that is there is no job for those who are a follower of jesus christ that is too low for us there is nothing as followers of Jesus Christ that we could say, I am better than that job. That's for, the, that's for those people. That's for these type of people. But I should have the bigger and better jobs because I'm in a higher position or I'm better than that. There, there is no higher position 
for those who are in Christ. We are all called to do whatever it is God calls us to do. And perhaps sometimes those jobs won't be dirty and perhaps sometimes they will be the lowliest of low jobs, the dirtiest and nastiest job you can imagine. Perhaps in times of service to other people, we may find ourselves in situations where we say, God, you want me to do what? And maybe it will be something that we consider to be difficult or scary or maybe even kind of gross, like watching somebody's feet. But what did Jesus say? He says, do what I have called you to do. Follow my example. Now, Jesus is beautiful in this way in that everything he has called us to do, he has been our example. He has been our example, a great example in everything we see in Scripture, a perfect example. This is how we are to live. What Jesus calls us to do is what he has already done on our behalf and what he has shown us to do. Jesus came to serve, to give his life for you and I. And what a beautiful example of what it means to serve we see here in John 13, where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. So let us do the same. Let us look to Jesus as our example. When we say, God, this this, 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 this is kind of a gnarly thing you're calling me to do, but God, help me to be humble to do what you've called me to do. Whether it's washing someone's feet, whether it's giving our life for someone else, Jesus says and shows us, this is what I have done for you. And this is how you can live for me, by following my example. Let us be those tonight who follow the example set before us in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you and we thank you for these beautiful words. And I pray, God, that you would help us to be humble. That we would not be so proud that we would neglect doing things that you call us to do, dear Lord. There are some things that are that are just kind of nasty and just kind of dirty and and just kind of tough, dear Lord. But God, maybe there are opportunities to serve that we, we need to say, you know what? This person needs help. There's, a, there's something that I can do. There's some way that I can support. There's some way that I can be part of, of something or some, someone, dear Lord. Let us have a heart of service that we would, that we would humble ourselves, dear Lord. That we would help whoever we can, no matter how difficult it may be. That we would follow the example of Jesus Christ and God that we would even do good to those that don't do good to us. God, Jesus knew that Judas was about to betray him. But dear Lord, we don't see in the scripture that Jesus treated Judas any different than the rest of the disciples, dear Lord. He washed his feet just the same. So God, let us not only do good to those who do good to us, but let us do good to those that perhaps have betrayed us or have treated us wrong. God, let us love them to the end in hopes, dear Lord, that perhaps their heart would change. Let us follow the example of Jesus Christ that on our journey, whatever you call us to, that we would be faithful to the end just as Jesus Christ was all the way to the end of death on the cross. And God, we thank you that you raised him again three days later. And God, let us find hope and assurance in that. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.